While Faith No More would blend together multiple styles including metal and funk, they would be one of the most exciting bands to emerge from the late 80s and early 90s. But their first decade together would prove to be a tumultuous time for the group, and today we're going to explore that era of the band. Adopted at the age of one, Faith No More's frontman Chuck Mosley would grow up in Los Angeles, and his adoptive parents actually met in the socialist and communist scene in LA with his father at one point being arrested by the FBI. His dad, interestingly enough, was also a bodyguard for actor, musician, and activist Paul Robeson and was friends with Charlie Chaplin. The seeds of Faith No More would be planted when Mosley met bassist Billy Gold at a punk rock show and Mosley soon enough would join Gold's group named The Animated as a keyboardist. They would play together for a short period of time before finally going their separate ways. It was during their time apart, Mosley founded the group Haircuts That Kill. It was in 1984 that both musicians reconnected when Mosley became the frontman for Gold's new outfit, Faith No More. Funny enough, Courtney Love had actually fronted the band for a short period of time before, and while Mosley was only supposed to front the band for what was expected to be a few shows, his tenure with the band stretched into a couple of years. The band would hook up with producer Matt Wallace for their first release, 1985's We Care A Lot. Wallace would recall what Mosley brought to the band during this period, Recalling to Pop Dose, for the first day Chuck just literally did screaming. Hardcore punk for lack of a better word. Wallace and the guys in the band had to actually take Mosley to the side and tell him to put a little more melody in his voice and he really took that advice to heart and showed up the next day and had a completely different approach to laying down the vocals. Released on indie label Mortem, the album would catch the attention of label Slash Records, who signed Faith No More and put out their subsequent release, Introduce Yourself, which came out in 1987. The record would contain a re-recording of the song We Care A Lot from their debut album, and it would actually get some play on MTV. Since the record We Care A Lot was not widely available, some people who bought Introduce Yourself thought it was Faith No More's debut album. Despite being on a bigger label, getting some exposure on MTV, and establishing a fan base in the UK, the band still weren't selling a ton of albums, and couple this with Mosley's erratic behavior on tour, and the band's future seemed pretty grim. Adding to the tension was that the members were picking on Mosley incessantly on tour. It came to a head when Mosley allegedly punched Billy Gould on stage, while at the same time Mosley's roadie got into a brawl with guitarist Jim Martin and it resulted in Martin breaking his hand. So the band ended up firing Mosley's roadie and Chuck was trying to stick up for him. And it only inflamed tensions. The band played their last show with Mosley on May 24th, 1988 at London's Town and Country Club. There was another show where Mosley's substance abuse issues were front and center when the frontman fell asleep during a record release party for Introduce Yourself. When the band returned home, things really didn't get any better. It was in rehearsals with Mosley that the frontman told his bandmates he only wanted to do acoustic songs, and that attitude infuriated Gold so much that he quit the band. But it was upon talking to his bandmates, minus Mosley, they agreed that they still wanted to play music together, so the only viable option was to fire Chuck, and that's what they did. Soon enough, a nasty legal battle ensued, with both parties eventually reaching an out-of-court settlement. Gold would tell Reflex Magazine, We knew we wanted to continue as a band, but it's an audacious step to take. If I'm really into a band and they change their singer, I'm pretty much dismiss them right away. The worst slap in the face were accusations that it was a racial thing, like we wanted to get a white singer, which was really insulting, but it went pretty smoothly considering. It was Chuck's attitude and his insecurity about his talents that weighed heavily on him throughout the rest of his life. A close personal friend and his biographer would tell Decibel, his self-doubt, it consumed him. It caused him to shoot himself in the foot over and over, typically at the worst times. He's always waiting for someone to turn off our sound and accuse him of being a fraud. He would go on to add that being put up for adoption had a profound impact on Mosley as he never found out why his biological parents left him. Faith No More would end up getting to work on their third record without a singer. Their future frontman Mike Patton had actually come on the band's radar two years prior, and he had met the band and given a demo tape to the group of his outfit, Mr. Bungle. Patton at the time was studying English and was working at a record store. It would be guitarist Jim Martin and drummer Mike Borden who reached out to Patton to audition. He'd tell an interviewer, according to Faith No More followers in 1989, people were calling us and saying, yeah, I heard your tape from Jim Martin, and I was like, what, who's Jim Martin? Then one day I get this call from this old sounding guy, Hey man, want to come down and jam? This is Jim from Faith No More. I just really resisted at first. I was really flabbergasted. I'm like, wow, I can't do this. I wasn't in a situation where I wanted to change. Patton would eventually agree to audition after his bandmates and Mr. Bungle convinced him to do it, and they even tagged along for the journey. 
By the time Mike Patton joined Faith No More, the group's third record, The Real Thing, was pretty much done with the exception of the lyrics. Patton was about one of five singers who auditioned. One future superstar who the band also wanted to join was Chris Cornell of Soundgarden. Patton would join the group and within two weeks he wrote the lyrics and the melodies. The band would introduce Patton to their fan base in November of 1988 at a gig at the I-Beam in San Francisco. But it was a bittersweet introduction. It was following that show, according to Louder Sound, Patton was given a note by the bouncer who told him it was from a girl in the audience. Patton, feeling pretty good, thought he won over old fans of the band, but was surprised when he opened the letter and read the message which stated, You're a macho creep and an asshole. F you pig, we want Chuck back. But it wasn't all bad. Bam Magazine would write a review of the band's first show with their new singer, saying, Who knew what to expect when Faith No More unveiled their new singer at the I-Beam recently? But Patton lay waste to the band's previous singer. Patton's advantages, he wasn't drunk, he can sing, he can dance, he has energy and conviction. The band seemed recharged and ready to roar with new material that could break the band big. Talk about foreshadowing. Released in June of 1989, Faith No More's third record, The Real Thing, wasn't an immediate hit. While the band enjoyed a good fan base in the UK, soon enough America would call themselves fans too. The first single from out of nowhere was released in the UK and seemed to largely go unnoticed, but things changed with her second single. Drummer Mike Borden would recall to Louder Sound, the label had spent their wad emotionally and financially on supporting from out of nowhere and it did nothing, literally nothing. They came to us in London and met us at the Columbia Hotel and they basically said, rather than have us pick the next single, we want you to tell us what single to put out. We unanimously wanted Epic because we loved the song at that point and how it worked for us on stage. It had many different elements to it that weren't traditional in approach. Epic would prove to be Faith No More's biggest hit of their career, peaking at number 9 on the Hot 100 chart and number 2 on the Rock charts, and the band followed it up with a single Falling to Pieces, which was another hit. The record would go on to peak at number 11 in America, selling a million copies, going platinum. But Epic would catch some flack from animal rights groups for the closing shot showing a flopping fish gasping for air. The tour to support the group's third record also had some special moments, as the band were in Germany when the Berlin Wall came down, and it also hit the road with Metallica. With the real thing, Faith No More were now at the forefront of a new musical movement that was being carved out by fellow groups like Soundgarden and Jane's Addiction. Faith No More would continue to have success in the 90s before breaking up in 1998 and reforming again in 2009. As for Chuck Mosley, to cope with his departure from Faith No More, he ended up turning to drugs and briefly fronted the group Bad Brains. He would also form the group Cement, who had some success, but ahead of the band's second record coming out, he was involved in a bad motor vehicle accident. In his later years, Mosley took up a job as a chef to support his two children. He would end up reconvening with Faith No More and joining them on stage from time to time, and he was also getting busy musically in the later part of his life. Sadly, in 2017, he'd be found dead due to a drug overdose. That concludes today's video, guys. Thanks for watching, and we'll see you again in Rock and Roll Stories. Take care.